Hi, I'm Dale Popovich and welcome to my studio. We're going to have these watercolor escape Saturdays the every every third uh, Saturday of the month uh, as opposed to last year we were doing it every Saturday. But so we are going to be painting and talking about values today and what we're going to do is I'm going to do a little advertising here. Um, if you'll sign up for my newsletter and like my page I would appreciate that and all the information that I'm talking about today will be uh, eventually in, in, on YouTube and in my newsletter. Share the recommended paper, uh, the brushes I use, the supplies. I have all the videos and I will post the blogs and so forth. And I also have an online art school called Towering Winds Academy of Fine Arts. My in-person workshop for 2021 um, I'm going to have a two-day, full-day workshop, June 3rd and 4th, up in Land Lakes, Wisconsin. And it's going to be on waterfalls and rapids of the Great North Woods. And you can find that at lolaartsinwisconsin.com. And I also have an in-person uh, three-day workshop, June 25th, 26th, and 27th, at the McCord Art Gallery, Painting Rivers, Rapids, and Waterfalls in Palos Heights. And that's at the McCord Gallery. And I'm also having a two-day workshop in Brown County in Nashville, Indiana, at the Brown County Art Gallery, July 17th and 18th. And is Watercolor Impressions of the Great North Woods at Doman's Resort in Lac de Flambeau. That's four full days, September 26th to October 1st. I have online workshops uh, at Chesterton Art Gallery, two days, April 24th and May 8th. The April 24th is the demonstration and questions are asked online, which my wife will feed to me. And on May 8th, two weeks later, I do a critique of their work and I also allow one extra piece of artwork that they've done on their own that I'll critique. And that's at Chesterton Art Gallery in Indiana. I do in-person um, classes at Lake Zurich at Main Street Art Center. And I also have online classes, Zoom classes, at the Palette and Chisel on Thursdays from 10.30 to 1. Today I'm going to have you understand the importance of value. That's what I'm going to, my main thrust of this is. So I'm going to be doing two watercolors today, two small ones. And I'm going to focus on value. This is what we're going to do is I'm going to start and I'm going to go over to my easel and we'll start here. And what I want to explain to you is the values that we normally see, uh, there's four what we call con angles and consequent values. We have the sky, which is the number one light, because the light comes from the sky. And it recedes to darker and grayer as it goes back and it gets a little bit cooler. But since we're looking at values, it gets darker and grayer as it goes back, or lighter and grayer, I'm sorry. And then we have the ground itself, which is the second lightest plane. And that's because it's receiving light from the sky and it's a horizontal plane. Then we have the slanted planes, which are mountains, roofs, um, any slope. And as you move your paper up, in other words, if I take this piece of paper here, this is receiving more light here. When we angle it up, it gets darker. And then when we put it vertical, which is our fourth darkest plane, um, we have to be conscious of that. Now, that is something that you have to understand. It's not talking about man-made objects. This is just what we see in nature. And this is basically the way it looks as far as sky, land, mountains, and then I have upright planes of just trees. But it's very but simple it to understand if you can understand the value patterns and how to adjust them um, and what you're seeing is very important. This is a value chart that I made for our foundation course. And also for my studios in, the st in workshops and so forth. And this helps you see what kind of value. Now this is more of a high key painting here. If you can see this, it's very simple. I did this without a drawing, but you can 
put holes in your value chart. And you can see with looking at the values and so forth on the photograph to what you have on your painting. So I have 100% is black and 0% is white. And we have three values of lights, three values of midtones, and three values of darks. Now, anything from midtone back to light is part of the light area. Anything that is from 70% to 80, 90% is part of the shadow. So this right here is all shadow. This right here is all light. And nothing can be as light in the shadow area as it is in the light. So you have to make sure that you have your patterns of value holding together. Now, this is another very quick, this has got a lot of different value spans in it from everything from the lights to the darks up here. And what you need to always look at is to compare your value. Squint your eyes down for the value and open it for the color. And the thing that I'm always telling the students is that the values will always make the painting hold together. That's what makes the painting work. And the color is secondary to the value. So if your values are not right, your color is not going to be to do anything for it. Base it on a book by John Carlson. And this is kind of like the Holy Bible of for artists, for painters and so forth, as far as I'm concerned. It's very plain, simple, to the point. Um, it's very easy reading. It's it's not that thick, and it runs about $10, $12. You can pick it up at Amazon, sometimes cheaper. But it's an excellent book for the beginner or the intermediate or even a reminder to advanced students. Also, it was asked if the handouts are going to be um, posted somewhere. If you sign up for the newsletter, they'll be in the newsletter. Yeah, we try to make everything available in the newsletter that I'm talking about. And again, this book is extremely important to uh, any artist for the most part. I've talked to a number of different artists from the East Coast to the West Coast, and a lot of them use this particular book. It's a wonderful book. Um, what I'm painting today is the Wisconsin River. And the Wisconsin River, this is right at the very beginning. I've painted this a number of times at different times of the year. And the colors I'm using today are core watercolors. And I started using these about two, two and a half years ago. And it has what I call a fairly, fairly accurate sheet of colors. It tells you everything about the color, the value, the intensity, and so forth. And it gives you a rundown of what it looks like when it's darker to what it's lighter in each of these categories. And like I said, I've been using these for a, a long time as far as everything goes. And I've used a number of different name brands and this one I'm completely happy with. And I pick up different colors. I've used a number of these and um, they are high quality and they are long lasting. They're light resistant. Um, and I really enjoy using them. So if you're interested, uh, this will be in the newsletter also. Now, I'm going to do a two-color painting of the Wisconsin River. It is a darker, overcast day, as it is lots of times in the winter up there. But anyways, we usually go down to the Wisconsin River after we have breakfast on New Year's Day and take pictures. And this is an as the Northwoods is, it's always ever-changing with the level of water, the amount of snow. Uh, there's been points where the rivers froze over and you can't even denote it from where the woods start to where they end. But it is an interesting area. So I'm going to use two colors. I'm going to use a warm color. Um, I'm using transparent brown oxide, which is a resemblance to burnt sienna. And I'm using ultramarine blue. So I'm using a warm color and a cool color. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by blocking it in. And your block in is always dealing from large areas to small areas. You're working from background to foreground. You're working your values from lighter to darker as we 
move through the painting. And we are working our colors more intense at the beginning and grade down less intense as we move through it. So I'm going to start off with the ultramarine blue. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a beautiful color. Um, and a little bit of the brown oxide. And this is going to be kind of grayed down in the background. I'm going to allow some of the light to come through from the paper. I'm not going to cover just everything. And as I move towards the middle, this is the brown oxide. I'm going to be starting to add a little bit more brown. And this color is really kind of a nice color. It's a little bit different than burnt sienna. But I'm going to add a lot of warmth in the middle where I want some light coming through and then I'm moving over here I'm going to use a little bit more blue and I'm going to take my toothbrush at this point and I'm going to hit this just with a little bit of water this way I can control the water just a little bit more than with the spray bottle but choosing limited palette sometimes gives you an advantage to get an idea of how you want the painting to look rather than going into full color or more color than just two. And as I said, I always try to do a value sketch before painting, especially with a new subject. It helps me understand uh, what's going to go on in the painting. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down into the bottom part of the painting and I'm going to start with the water in here a little bit and the reason why I'm doing this is I'm leaving this time enough to dry and as I'm always telling the students timing is everything in watercolor so I'm kind of jumping around a little bit I'm going to bring some of this color down in here that has the warmth in it and then I'm going to go much darker into the water in the foreground. And this is a again a very simple thing. The second painting I'm going to be doing is with four or five colors. So I'm going to change the mood and the whole look of the painting as we move through it. But I just want to have you have you have a good understanding of what the value is doing and how you can have the value express itself more fully and not be concerned about what color it is. And I'm always trying to get across to my students, it's the value. And if you have your value correct and you have your intensities correct and you have your temperatures correct, if you are off on the color, it's not going to make that much of a difference. As long as that form of value holds it together, and I'm going to put a little bit more in here, let it drip down. Linda Herb said hello. Hello, Linda. And she says she has the book, and it's very helpful. So I've painted all the way around the white here, and I want to go in... And I want to catch any excessive water in here at this point. So I don't want it really dripping down into the other areas. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to tone that far bank down in the, in the background here that's up against that snow. And I'm going to leave a little bit of white show here and there. Not too much. And as I'm always telling the students, your watercolor at the beginning is almost you're almost like a car crash. I'm going to put some cast shadows across here. But you have to kind of control the car crash. That's the hard part. My first watercolors in, in uh, class when I was a student were the most wonderful, ugly things you've ever seen. Um, you just don't catch on to watercolor that quick all the time. So, I'm still looking at my value sketch here. 
and I've denoted that light form in the middle. And as I build up the darks, it's something that I'm going to pay attention to. You always go back to the background, which is where I'm headed next. And I'm going to clean my palette off. <clears throat> I'm not worried about the color. Again, as I said, I'm worried about how the values read. And if you can't read the values, you're going to lose your painting very, very quickly. So I'm going to go to a smaller brush here. Um, Menika from India says hello. Hello. And she said this looks insightful. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, we got a lot of people there. A lot of people joining you. All right. Now, when you feel whether it's dry or not, you feel with the back of your hand, the front has oil on it. So if this is wet or, or semi-cool, uh, it hasn't totally dried. You can also tell by the bounce of the paper. By the way, I am on indigo paper today, which is a handmade paper. Um, my wife ordered it for me several years ago. Uh, I had never used it. It's a very soft paper. And the first time I used it was during a demonstration in my studio. And I was lifting kind of vigorously with an oil painting brush, which I do occasionally. And I went right through the paper. Um, when the laughter died down, I charged them twice as much for the class that night. Um, so anyways, it's a very soft paper, but it's highly textured. This is 300 pound uh, indigo paper. You can get it in a 210 or a 200 weight 10 pound. Um, for a little bit less. This runs about $32 for three full sheets of 22 by 30. Uh, it has a handmade feeling, but the 210, uh, which I believe you can get at the um, art store Fine or art store. Fine Art Store. It's out in, in New York. Rochester, uh, maybe? Rochester, um, New York State. And you can get the 210 pound and for the same price, you can get five sheets of the indigo paper um, for the same price as three sheets. And it, I've used it, and I really like both weights. They both react very well. So, okay, this is dry now back here. I'm going to go in with my smaller cat tongue brush, and I'm going to take the ultramarine blue here. And I'm going to take a little bit of the burnt sienna. And again, I'm not worried about color, but I'm not going to cover the entire thing going on here. I'm going to allow these colors to show through, but I'm going to dry brush this in. And I'm going to take my time. Your process slows down in the second pass through the watercolor. You don't want to speed things up. You want to take your time a little bit. And I'm allowing that first phase of color to continue to show through. And occasionally I will take the toothbrush with water on it. And I'll try softening my edges in the painting. I try to keep my edges as soft as I can for as long as I can. I don't want any hard edges or sharp edges because... That is what attracts the eye. And I don't want any drips. So I'm starting to show a little bit more warm color as I come into the middle here. I'm going to go very, very lightly with some of the ultramarine blue. And I'm starting to form some of the trees. Now, I'm not following the photograph all that much for the fact that you really can't see a whole lot of tree tree action going on in the background because it is so dark. But I'm starting to get a little bit of movement up in here and I'm going to tone come in the other side here and I'm going to use a little bit of the burnt sea or the red uh, brown oxide with the ultramarine blue. And I'm painting in different directions to get the feeling of the trees without painting the trees individually. Now if you have any 
questions, my wife will feed them to me and I will answer them for you. So I'm allowing some of that sunlight to come through. We're actually, in this photograph, we are facing south. And I'm going to take a little bit of the ultramarine blue. All right, Mantika. Oh, she just jumped. Uh, would you would you recommend stretching paper, soaking in water, etc., uh, every time before starting the painting? Is this is that mandatory? Um, no, not in all cases. Um, when I was a student, we were using ninety pound paper. Uh, that had to be put in a water vat for 10 to 12, 15 minutes, and it would expand. And then we would staple it down onto a board that would take staples, and then it would contract back like a tight as a drum. Um, the thing is with that, it's a bit of a pain in the butt and time consuming to use 90 pound paper. And 90 pound paper is not that wonderful. Even if you're learning, I'm adding a little bit of, of burnt sienna in here now. Uh, even if you're learning, it, it's a pain in the butt. I would not go any less than 140 pound paper. And at the beginning when you are learning for the fact that um, the 140 pound, you can stretch that as I with it like the 90 pound, or you can tape it just across the top and two little tabs of paper on the side because that's going to expand and contract too. The 300 pound or the 210 pound, as I mentioned, um, I do not stretch. I just simply tape it down and I'm done. So that's, that's basically with the paper. But I'm also, what I need to mention is that your watercolor paper needs to be 100% cotton and make sure that it states it on the label that you're buying. I just add a little bit more ultramarine blue over here. Um, the reason being is that if it's not stated 100% cotton, it has wood fibers in it, it will pill up and it just will not perform as well. Um, the other thing is that um, the difference between the block paper that Archer sells and some other name brands is that it doesn't have a lot of sizing on the paper and it doesn't float the watercolor as long. This is, you get into personal taste and so forth, but um, I like a little bit more sizing on the paper. And when I do add water and move things around, it's actually removing some of it. It's part of the glue, but they use it to hold the fibers together and then they spray it for protection and shipping. With the block paper, it's all enclosed and they don't have to protect anything. So that's the difference in, in the paper, but make sure that it is 100% cotton. Now, I've got the background kind of set the way the second phase would be. And I'm gonna go into, again, the foreground and I'm gonna start with the water here. So I'm always working background to foreground. Very seldom do I work any other way. Yep. Shanelyn Martinez said she's loving this. And Brad Fields wants to know, when you're off camera, do you still work on an easel or do you paint flat? Okay. Um, both ways. If I'm working wet on wet, I have it flat on my table and I'm standing over it. Um, that keeps all your edges soft for a long time. Uh, then I would put it back on an easel as I project through it, unless I need to do something else that would make it run. But I do work flat. And hi, Brad. I love your paintings, by the way. Um, it's something that, uh, as I've do, done more demonstrations over the years, and with people kind of around you, or if you're on camera, I've been learning to work more upright. Until we get a second camera on the ceiling, then I'll be able to work some uh, more flat and more wet on wet. So I'm coming down into the water here again. And I want, there's a transition place right in here with the dark water to the light water. And I'm going to, just beyond there, I'm going to allow a little bit of water and I'm going to allow it to just sort of phase in there. Sometimes I'll add water, but you have to be kind of quick in doing this. 
and now I'm going to add some more and I'm going to take a lot of this blue here that I just put down and I'm going to spray a little bit of the burnt sienna in with it so it melds on the paper I don't mind if it drips off the paper here but I'm painting my reflection down into the water I do use the toothbrush a lot, but I do clean my wife's toothbrush after I put it back, or before. It's a joke that runs with us. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a brush here. I've let this sit long enough, and it's got a nice light reflection here. And I'm going to bring this down into here, like so to have a little bit different of a transition of this water coming down here. So I've got things situated to where I have an imprint of my uh, idea of what I want to do with it and how I want it to look. And I'm waiting for things to dry. So I'm always talking in between even when I'm demonstrating for my students uh, so that I can go back in and make those adjustments. And I just want to remind any beginning student, when I was a beginning student, is that um, I have a lot of my old watercolors in a landfill someplace. And you continue to make mistakes even as you grow. Uh, so don't be worried about making a mess. Don't go in trying to make it absolutely perfect at the beginning. You go in there to learn. You go in there to stretch. You go in to make mistakes so that you will progress much faster. Now I'm adding a little bit more dark to the bank of the river back here. Let it flow together. Um, I still consider myself a student to a great degree for the simple fact that I don't want to stop learning how to handle the watercolor, different ways to do things, different papers, whatever the case may be. So now I've got that bank put in back there and um, it's pushing that bank back because it is in shadow, but you'll see that watercolor dries lighter. And as it dries lighter, um, you kind of have to sit there and watch. And this is one thing I cannot teach my students is how it dries because it's different with every name brand just a little bit, but with every color. Um, and I'm always kind of watching how things watch how they dry and learning how to anticipate um, how they're going to dry how light how dark whatever the case may be um, it's always something of a challenge when you're using something new i will admit so i'm going to take a little bit of water here on the toothbrush and I'm going to take the clean part of the paper towel and I'm just going to lift up just a little bit just to give this I'm going to work back over this later but I'm going to I want to see how it reacts to things later on so I'm going to go back to the background again this is what you call the third phase And if you're getting this part right, that's good. If it's not, there are adjustments you can make. But I'm going to start by putting in some darker trees here. I'm going to be a little bit more exact about what I'm doing. I'm going to bring some trees into the snow area to show depth. That one tree is out in front of the other. And I'm making my trees less straight than they are actually in the photograph because these trees were intentionally planted years and years ago. Any other questions at yeah, all? Yeah, I'm just answering somebody. Um, June, who's from the UK. Hello, June. Said she just happily stumbled upon this. And she was wondering if you're going to be in the UK live. Um, nothing planned yet. Nothing planned yet, no. And, Not um, that I don't want to, but... I told her to sign up for your newsletter. So somewhere, somehow... 
so you can get this. There we go. Just so you guys know, if you want to sign up on his newsletter, you can do it on the Facebook page, or you could go to his website, Dale, D-A-L-E, Popovich, P-O-P-O, -O, V is in Victor, I-C-H, dot com. At the top of the home page, there's a place where you can also sign up. And all this information on values, the whole newsletter is just going to be talking about values. This these paintings you're seeing today, there'll be a video link to it, to YouTube. There'll be the the uh, value um, sheet that he showed you, and the diagrams that he sketched will all be included in the newsletter, along with a few other little goodies about values. See, what I always find amazing with any artist, or watercolors especially, because that's what I'm involved in, is we all paint differently. Thank God, because we'd all be boring. I'm always telling students, look at the different ways in which you can do things, how you can approach things. And I take a lot of back of older paintings that I don't like, and I simply play. If I do this, what happens? If I do that, what happens? So I'm adding some things in here, hopefully to make this a little bit more interesting. I'm being conscious of the size of the trees, the spacing between the trees, um, so that everything is always a little bit different. Maria um, Bass wants to know, are the reflections always darker than the trees or other background? It depends on what's around it. It is grayer. Um, I have to say that it's sometimes almost equal in value, but since the reflection is closer to us, the darks will be darker. Um, and what I'm always very conscious of is not to make a perfect reflection. In other words, if there was a building here, I don't make a perfect reflection down here. I always kind of make it obscure from the actual building up above. I don't try to make a perfect reflection, but this is going to be darker down here because your darks, as they recede, they get lighter in value. Now, there's not much distance here. Um, but your lights, as they recede, they get darker. So what happens in value-wise is that your darks are darkest up near you and your lights are lightest up near you. And what happens is they get closer together in value. And to explain that maybe a little bit better, and I'll wait for this to dry a second, um, is that if you have a newly blacktop road that's very, very dark, uh, in value, it's going to be darkest nearest us. As it recedes away from you going down the hill and across the prairie, it gets lighter in value. And that's called aerial perspective. In other words, you're seeing things through the different particles in the air and it reduces the value of the darks. Now, the lights, if you paint a brand new white line down the middle of the road, that white line is lightest near you and it gets darker as it goes away because of the aerial perspective. So you have less contrast in the background. Um, things diminish totally in detail in the background. And again, as an artist, you're really employing yourself to entertain people. And you want them to look here, you want them to look there. Make them look there by creating a good focal point. A good focal point or center of interest is all about placement, size, detail, contrast of value, intensity of color, just to name a few. Um, you don't always need a focal point, but it makes a stronger composition. Um, you can have points of interest that lead the eye around the composition, but I always suggest to the students have a focal point. Now, this... Barbara, Barbara Berry said she's learning a lot today. Good. Hello, Barbara. All right, I'm going to come down to the more come down more forward here and I'm going to take a little bit of the ultramarine blue and I'm going to take a little bit of the burnt sienna and I usually what I do is I put it on an opposite end so that I can kind of come in here not with the full blast of color and I can see what I'm doing um, I was amazed on how and I don't over mix my colors when I take something I mix it in very quickly um, and I'm going to start 
making this a little bit more correct in value and in form. I'm looking at the photograph and I am adjusting things to a certain extent. Um, I never ever paint exactly what's in the photograph. I'm always telling my students, you're painting the painting, not the photograph. So be very careful on what you put in. It's always more important what you leave out than what you put in. Maria said, thank you. You're welcome. And I'm coming across here and we're trying to get the form and value correct. Um, I'm not worried about little things that happened on their own. Sometimes I like what happens on their own. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to, I'm also looking at the photograph. I'm looking at my, my value study. But I'm starting to make the values darker, more correct. I'm not going to cover everything. I'm going to allow some of these things to come forward. I'm not going to detail this out because I want you to understand that uh, the details always last. And in a demonstration, it's something that, how far do you want to take the painting? And to detail it out crazily is sometimes uh, not the thing to do during a demonstration because you're, we're using it as a learning tool. So I'm making my darks darker down here and I'm allowing some of that original wash or secondary wash to show through. I'm not overly concerned about it. I'm very casual as I come off to the side here. Um, <clears throat> I want to tone down the reflection of the snow bank here just a little bit. And I can always sit there and wait for it to dry just a tad. And then I can adjust it. And I usually use a bigger brush most of the time for adjusting things. Now I'll take and I'll separate, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to separate the um, snow mound from the reflection just a little bit here. Just to give a little bit better form. Hi, JR City. Um, I love your cover photo. Very creative. <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> my wife is the technical support that I need at all times. Uh, she does all the editing. And as I'm always telling people, I am the brush and she is the brains of the whole operation. <clears throat> so we make a good team. Uh, Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. How you doing out in Crete? She said, uh, great demo and that you are inspiring her. Thank you. I just want to show people what you can do with two colors. You don't always have to work with full color. Um, some of the things that I see happening sometimes, even in my workshops, they want to put out every color that they have and they don't even use all of them. Um, that is something you don't want to do. Just put out the colors you're using. I always keep my colors in the same order as typewriter keys would be on a typewriter. I don't uh, change the position of them. And I'm just going in, I'm going to do some final details here. I don't want to go in and do a crazy um, detailing on this because I want to um, do the more detailed painting on the second painting here. So. I'm going to bring some of these trees a little bit more forward here. I don't want to spend too long on this. I don't know how much time I've spent on it already. Um, 46 minutes. Well, it's 46 minutes since we okay. started. All right. And the last thing that I want to do <clears throat> is I want to pull out excuse me, some light trees in here that's receiving a little bit more light by simply cleaning the brush, pulling out all the moisture. 
And I'm not even telling you what kind of trees they are. These are actually pines in the photograph, but I don't feel you have to show that in this particular case. I'm going to put a, a bigger tree in here that's a little bit lighter. But you can do all sorts of things here, fallen tree through here. But it's all little areas, so you're working from that large to small. I'm going to pull a little bit more notation in that bank here. But it's just a matter of slowing your process down. The beginning part's very quick, but as you go through the painting, slow it down. And believe me, I still make mistakes. I think any artist that tells you they don't make mistakes anymore that's been doing it for a while, I don't think they're telling you the exact truth. Because for some reason, all our paintings don't look the same. They're not of the same quality. Some are better than others. And those are the ones that we usually, hopefully, put into the show. Or a juried show. So, that is the simple two-color painting. And let me take the tape off. So you can see. And as I said before, the paper is very soft, so I don't burnish the tape down. The paper sometimes will come up with it depending on how sticky my tape is. But why, why do you use tan tape? I use a very neutral tape. I'm always telling my students do not use colored tape because it will influence the color that you're putting down. So this is a very simple idea, and this is what I may do for a idea for a new subject matter. I'll do a color rough. Usually I don't do the pencil, but I do recommend it for uh, a, a newer student. You can't see the, no, can't see, yeah. I usually recommend this for a newer student, but uh, to give themselves a better idea of uh, a, a road map. It's like taking notes in class. The more you put on paper, the more you'll remember. If you just try to remember it off the top of your head, you won't. But this is a very simple rendition. Two colors, a warm color and a cool color. And I use the ultramarine blue and the transparent brown oxide. Let's go to the second painting. I'm going to get some clean water. Okay. John Ross said that his friend uses black tape. Uh, black tape is okay. It's neutral. And the reason why I say that is that you can get uh, an idea of your value with black tape as you can with the tan tape. Color tape will throw you into a tilt sometimes. And he said that the functions as a dark reference. Yeah. That I can understand. Okay, I'm just going to take this up a little higher. Up, up, come on. Okay. Now. I think we have a few more comments. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Can we see the palette? Yes, I will show you that in a second here. Um, Monica said that it magical it was. And Lisa uh, Kruger is here, and she said beautiful. Hi, Lisa. I didn't mention she had said hello before. Okay. You were busy talking. So, yes, John Roth wants to see your palette. Okay, John, I use a fusion palette. Um, I started off using the enamel butcher's tray years ago. And since I do so much traveling, this fusion palette 
looks like this. Hopefully you can see it. Um, it comes with two trays and it gives me the mixing area that I need. But this is where I put my colors. I've got to hold this more straight. It's dripping on me. Um, and I always put them back in the same position. Now, this is the core watercolor paints I've been using. This is another brand I've been using. Um, sometimes I'll add uh, a different brand to my paints. But I don't eye. use alizarin crimson. Yeah, I perfect. use matter brown um, or brown matter. This is my burnt sienna, my um, sap green, my raw sienna, and I have uh, the three blues I use, the ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, and the manganese blue. Um, the manganese blue I've been using for quite a while in place of the cerulean blue. Uh, cerulean blue is something that um, I used to use a lot of. I still have some in my paint box but I don't use it too much anymore. So Jim Roth said thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, same painting. Now we're using five colors. We're going to use ultramarine blue, still, the brown oxide, still, and the three colors I'm adding are raw sienna for a warm yellow, my sap green, uh, and I'm using the manganese blue for my cool coolest blue. Now, the three blues I had mentioned, uh, ultramarine blue, cobalt blue, and the manganese blue, they're all cool colors, every single one of them. But they have different degrees of intensity, they have different value, uh, and they have different temperatures. The manganese or cerulean is your coolest blue. The cobalt blue is in the middle that is a little bit less cool blue than the manganese. And then finally the ultramarine blue, which is the warmer of the blue. Now, occasionally I'll use phthalo blue and that falls closer to the cerulean or manganese blue. It's a little bit cooler than the cobalt or the ultramarine. But it has the um, value of about 90% um, value on it and it is an extremely dark staining color. Um, occasionally I'll use it, but that's about as close as I get to black. I don't use black. I don't even mix up a black. Um, I feel that it can kill a painting very quickly. And I feel that the students need to understand how to cross mix color and gray color down with its complements or adjunct complements and not use black to gray things down. Uh, Jim Roth wants to know if you use fresh paint every time or re-wet it. Um, I use fresh paint almost every time. If I'm painting every day, one nice thing about the Fusion thing is I can close the lid, spray a little bit of water on it overnight, and it's still good the next day. If I am painting and the pigment is dry, I always add new paint. Always in the same place, of course. Okay. Let's get started. I don't need to use my big brushes that often on this painting because it's a small painting. And this particular paper, as I mentioned before, is the indigo paper. And this is a bright white. And they sometimes have a less white paper. It's got a little bit of a yellowish tint. I choose papers depending on the subject matter. I choose papers depending on the value. Since we're doing the snow scene, I chose the bright white. It's been bleached a little bit more. Um, Occasionally I use hot press paper for such as animal portraits or people portraits, which I do very seldom. Um, I don't call myself a portrait artist, but I do uh, paint them occasionally. Um, but I choose paper according to what my need is. So the hot press is very smooth and slick and the watercolor reacts differently on it. I can also get a more accurate drawing on the hot press as opposed to something that is extremely textured as this. So, okay, here we go. You can ask questions while I'm painting, please. I'm going to take the sap green, which this is kind of a, I don't know, good green. And I'm going to take the ultramarine blue. As I said, I put a little bit over here and I'm going to add a little bit as I need it. I'm going to take a little bit of the brown oxide and the brown being red, it's going to gray this down a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit more of the 
ultramarine blue to this. And I'm going to be very bold in my application. I'm always trying to have my students work bold enough. We have a certain fear of color when we first start painting. I know I did. And I'm going to start adding the raw sienna to this as I come out to the middle. So we got a lot of different color going on. I'm going to put the painting side by side when I finish just to see how the color creates a mood, creates a different look to things. It's definitely, we're attracted to color. But I'm adding a lot of the raw sienna here in the middle. Some pure raw sienna. And I'm being kind of conscious of the snow bank there. I'm going to go back to along the other side here with the ultramarine blue and the sap green, allowing them to kind of meld together a little bit. A little bit more ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna, just a slight bit to gray. Remember, red is a complement of green, so burnt sienna is a red. It's a grayed down red orange, basically. And I don't mind showing that light through there. It'll pick up another color later on. And I'm going to go along here at the bottom, and I'm going to be a little bit more careful in here, like so. And while this is wet, without having to touch the paper, I'm going to take the manganese blue here. It's a very bright, intense blue, and I'm going to hit this with a little bit of color here. And this way I'm not touching the paper because every time you touch the paper, what happens is you're pulling other paint off or mixing other paint. For some reason I can't get this to show. Let's try this again. Manganese blue is a interesting color. Right now it's not showing up a whole lot, which... I'm going to try. There we go. So now we're getting some. And I'm going to take my big brush here and I'm going to soak up anything at the bottom here that will drip. That way I can control it a little bit better. I'm going to take the manganese blue and it has a little bit of the raw sienna in it and I'm going to tone, including the water back here, tone that bank down just a little bit. I'm going to add a little bit of ultramarine blue to this because I'm always very conscious of having colors change, temperature changes, so that it's different going across or going away from you so that we don't get the same color, same value. So I am adding other color, other value to this so that you can see the change happening. And you know what, if you haven't done this before, you have nothing to lose except the piece of paper. And the other thing is nobody dies in the process, just the paper. So now I'm going to take the sap green, ultramarine blue, and a little bit of burnt sienna, and I'm going to put it down here. Now this is going to take on a whole different life than what the last painting was doing. And... I'm going to get this a little bit darker here. And if you, you have to wait up in here till this basically dries. Um, the temptation as a student is to go and play with it, adjust it, chase the water, chase the color. And that is where you make some big mistakes. Now I waited for this to dry and I'm going to put just a little bit of that cool blue across here and I'm going to kind of soften this a bit. And what I'm going to do up on top while it's still damp, something a little bit different. Take paper towel, tore it up. I'm going to wet it so that it kind of goes in a little ball like this, or 
and I'm going to do what we call a rag roll. And this will give me the instant texture that I can show some of that later on. And I'm not worried about it getting down on other things, but I can rag roll and create textures of nature without much effort. Now it's important that you keep your mixing tray clean because otherwise it will get your colors all gray and messy and you don't want that to happen. So try to keep it a little bit on the cleaner side than you normally would. And at this point I'm just going to do one thing. You can see what happened up here. So when I paint across this later I'm adding a little bit of water here so it runs. When I paint across this later, I will not cover all of this up here. I'll allow that to kind of show through. So it creates a little bit of depth in the painting. But you can see you want to get the imprint of the image down as quickly as you can. And when I have a building and so forth, I always try to incorporate the building within the first wash. I don't paint around the entire object. I want it somehow melded to the rest of the painting immediately so that I don't have to um, fix anything later on or soften an edge. Um, people have often asked me about mascoid. I use it occasionally. By the time I get down to the halfway down the bottle, it's a rubber ball because I don't use it that much. Um, it's something that if I have a small passage, such as a light branch or something, I will use um, maskoid so I don't have to interrupt my brush stroke. But then I have to go back in and soften some of those edges. I did this waterfall painting as a rough for the Lakeland Watercolor Society. I wanted to get a feeling of what was going on. There was no maskoid used in it, but I ended up pulling out with an X-Acto knife, little spurts of white. I do that always at the end because if you do it too soon and paint across it, it becomes darker because uh, you're opening up the fibers of the paper. But very lightly you go in and you start adjusting things, but I'm painting around the white of the paper to start with and then I'm adding other values in, very subtle values, so that because nothing is really white in, in reality, nothing's really black. I uh, started adding value and color to them. So the idea was to get the background to fall back because our eye is attracted to contrast of value, which is right in here. That's the focal point. But I even tried to make the rocks a little bit different from left to right. Uh, the background is even a little bit darker in most cases. But just hinting at shapes up there gives an idea of a little bit of depth, but not overly done. In the photograph, it showed a little bit more than what needed to be stated. All right, now we can go back into what I'm doing. So you see the basic imprint there of the river with the woods behind it. And I'm going to again go back to the back. And I'm going to take uh, my smaller cat tongue brush in this case. And I am going to take the ultramarine blue and the sap green and a little bit of the burnt sienna again. Different combinations. Yes. Jim Roth said he's going to try the rag roll. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, I paint sometimes with a lot of texture, and I can't take credit for all of it. Um, there was a book I bought from about John Blockley. He was an Irish watercolorist or an English watercolorist, and I learned how to handle certain textures and so forth. He has since passed away, but the most that I learned was actually from my student in a studio here. She's a faux painter, and she was she was hired to do textures, marbling, granite, any type of stone thing or scenery on people's walls. And I asked her how she did certain things, and she brought in samples, and she explained it to me. And I started experimenting with textures in watercolor in the same way. I said, if she can do that in oils, I should be able to do it in watercolor. So textures is kind of a fun thing. So she was rag rolling, which was popular, I think, in the 80s or something. Um, so I'm going to go in different directions here. And I'm going to get a, try to get a feeling for 
First the woods, not the trunks of the trees. Those are last. I'm going to have a little bit more pine look to the trees this time than in the last time. Sometimes I don't like to portray things that are not necessary. Yep. Uh, Fred said he uh, agrees with Jim. Uh, the rag rolling is a great technique. And thank you so much. You're welcome. And I always tell the students, if it works, you're a hero. That's what my life drawing teacher used to say. And if it doesn't, do it over. Um, and I've done a lot over. But the more I experiment, the more I can figure things out on how things can look as opposed to doing something a little bit differently or playing around with it. So I'm adding a little bit more texture. I'm allowing things to to uh, show through from the first wash. I'm also going to put in with my nail a couple of lighter trees here while it's still wet. And I'm going to come out, start getting this a little bit warmer by adding a little bit more burnt sienna with that combination. And every time I've done this, and I'll show you at the end some other paintings I've done in the past of this same scene, um, every time I've done it, it comes out differently. I just did this about two weeks ago as a demonstration using limited color. Um, with some students of mine up in Lake Zurich and it was it's amazing on how they all come out and when I'm doing a demonstration I always tell the student don't expect it to look like the photograph it may look like a different scene um, it's not going to look like mine make it look like yours you're painting the painting not the photograph so it comes out a little bit differently who's going to know I'm not going to tell anybody So I'm going to tease this in from the other side. Now I'm making sure that this part here is bigger than this part over here. So I'm trying to make this not equal when I'm doing it. Because you don't want things that are equal. You like them a little bit on the unequal side. And I'm going to take a little bit of the manganese blue here. And I am going to take some of the raw sienna straight and I'm going to spray it right in here. And what I'm doing with this, I'm just flicking the very end of it. If I want a big pattern, I'll pull it away from the painting to get more of a, I guess, a shotgun blast to this. And learning how to spray with the paintbrush uh, has been a challenge for uh, some students, but it all works out at the end. And I'm just trying to bridge this just a little bit so that it's not just a stripe down the middle. It's something that's a little bit more, um, I would say, and I'm bringing up some trees in here. And these are a little bit softer. So I'm getting a little bit more um, definition than I did with the two color. Because there is so much you can do with the two color. But you can do all sorts of things with more color. And I'm adding some distinct forms in this place. Where the last painting, when we see this at the end, you'll see that it is a lot more definition than the first painting and I'm adding in some trees coming down as snow I'm being conscious that there are different thicknesses so that we don't get things looking too equal variety is the spice of our life so let's use some and I'm allowing all these different patterns that I first put down in the background how it's reacting to what I'm putting on top of it and I'm not trying to cover it that's the last thing I want to do, is to cover everything I've done previous. And I don't worry about drips so much because I can always catch them soon enough. I don't worry about little things that go wrong. 
because I can always hopefully try to fix them. Now, here's some pure manganese blue in here, and I'm going to put kind of a tree in here with some of the manganese. It's not a real bright mixing color with other colors, so I'm using it on its own to a great extent. Now, I'm going to come down into the water and then go back to the banks of the river. So I am hopping around a little bit more than what I did in the last painting, but it allows me to finish one area for that phase and go on to the next area. Any more questions at all? No. Nobody's got questions. Get quiet today. It must be that daylight savings time. Now, while I have this a little wet up in here, I'm going to put these small definition of where the water hits the bank and slides underneath a little bit. I'll pronounce them a little bit more later. I am going to pull this out a little bit with my one inch flat. And I'm going to soften that a little bit. And then I'm going to go in with my darker darks in the middle. And I got a bluish green here that I want to put here. I want something that's very dark. So it emulates what's up on top. And then I'm going to hit it with the toothbrush a little bit. And I'm going to come over to the other side here. And this starts giving it a little bit more pronounced value. And I'm not allowing it to take over completely with what I initially put down. Okay, we got questions. Yes. First of all, um, Frances said that she loves the drips and the fluid touch. Kathy would like to know, could you please explain more when and how to use the toothbrush? <laughs> Uh, the toothbrush I use, I can use when it's real wet. I can use, it will disperse and kind of give a flavoring without showing too much texture when it's wet. When it's semi-dry, it will disperse quite a bit less and it will show more texture. Or you can do the toothbrush handling on dry paper, which I'm going to show you in a minute, but you can throw it on here and see if this is dry enough. No, it's not. Um, you can use just the water on the uh, dry paper and you can pull up texture. So you can use it when it's wet, you can use it when it's damp, or you can use it when it's dry. You can use the color when it's damp, you can use it when it's semi-wet, or even when it's dry. But you can also use water and I'm waiting for this to dry before I attempt it because if I go back in too quick, um, it won't have the right look to it. So if you want another question while you're waiting, yep. uh, Jim would like to know, do you mostly use natural hair brushes? Always. All my hairs are on my brushes are natural hair except for I do have one or two brushes that are synthetic. Um, I use those when I'm adding opaque watercolor, or I use those for lifting. But most of the time, this brush is about 42, 43 years old. It's a one inch flat ox hair brush. It's made by Morella, and it's a number 202. I don't know if the company's in business anymore, but uh, this is my go-to brush for big washes. I have other brushes that are this big for larger paintings, but size of the brush de is determined by the size of the painting, but the um, real hair brushes load better the water and the pigment. Now, when you think about synthetic brushes, they're made of plastic or oil, if you want, and oil and water don't always mix, even though that they've perfected them 
much much better when they, than when they first came out. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of them uh, for watercolor. If you're painting acrylic, it might be a little bit different. Um, Katie said thank you, and Suzanne wants to know if you ever use indigo as a dark. Uh, no, it has um, black in the pigment. Um, if you look at the chemical, there's there's a chart you can look up on the internet on the makeup of every color, what's in it, and so forth. Indigo has a certain amount of black in the pigment, and when using it with other colors, uh, it grays things down very quickly, uh, which I don't like things grayed down too quickly. I like to have command of that. Um, but if you're doing a one color or two color with with indigo, uh, it should be pretty good. I mean, it's not that bad, but when you get into more than two colors, it will start reacting sometimes a little bit more than what you want it to. Okay, we got another one. Yeah. Oh, Jim said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Crushes. Okay. We got this dry enough. There was a question with when do you use a toothbrush? When don't you? Um, this is clean, clear water, and I'm going to put this here and there on the painting. And you don't have super control over this, just so you know, but I can pull up. You see a little bit of texture in here, and I repeat that until I get the desired effect. Now here you see it a little bit more with a dark area. You won't see it so much when you put it on a light area, but it will show up in a dark area very quickly. So you're seeing it, I can pick it up, it gives a texture. Depending on how much water you add, it gives a little bit more texture. If I want to add the color itself, in other words, let's say if I want to take the um, manganese blue, and this manganese blue is a little bit different than what I usually use, but We'll use it. I got all manganese blue in here. If I take this and I add a little bit of blue in here, you can see the blue showing up, hopefully. Uh, if I feel that I want to do something with it, I could take my damp brush and I can manipulate it into how I want it to appear. And I'm barely touching the paper, okay? And the idea is when you go back in and you start playing with things, you're lifting some pigment off the paper to some degree. And I'm always trying to tell students to be very careful with that. So I'm adding, I'm going to tone that bank down a little bit. I'm going to take a little bit of that manganese and a little bit of the raw sienna. And I'm going to start toning this bank down just a little bit so that it falls back beyond that front snow bank here. And I can take, if I have these light holes in here, I can tone those down because they are getting a little bit too light, like so. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, did I answer your question? I have a tendency of rambling off sometimes, so you got to catch me. Um, Patty wants a good demo. Thank you. you. And Cheryl Lynn says, is this watercolor, gouache, or acrylics? It is watercolor. I paint 90% 90, 90 of the time in watercolor. Uh, sometimes I will add gouache to it. Now I'm going to come in with some darker darks in here. And I'm emulating what's up on top here. But I'm also, if you can see this, I'm leaving light spots of the previous washes showing through so that it's not a flat value. And as I move through the painting, I'm adding different color, different value, different intensities. Um, my rule of thumb is, I'm always telling the students, every three to five brush strokes, change something, your value, your color, your temperature, your intensity, so that we don't end up with 
the same thing going from here to there. Um, I used to do that as a student, and it was like, why am I doing that? Well, I became, I loved the color I was using, I found what I liked, and then I started using it everywhere. And you don't want to do that. So now I'm going to denote this bank here just a little bit more. And then I'm going to go in here and very quickly put this in here. And then I'm going to spray it with a little bit of water. I want this to run down and meld just a little bit. And while that's happening, I'm going to take some of the raw sienna that I have up in here, and I want to flavor it down into here so it shows as part of the reflection. Cheryl Lynn, if you want to see this again, it will be on Dale's, on the page, his Observer Artist Watercolorist, looking videos. Also, I'm going to tell you to sign up for his newsletter, and I put a link in the comments and we'll make sure that you get a newsletter. The whole newsletter is going to be talking about values. If I have a link to this video, he's going to talk about values and maybe something he didn't cover in this talk. Um, also, the handouts. The um, He had some um, diagrams that he drew up. Those will also be uh, PDF downloads. And the um, little value chart that he had with the holes punched in it. We're going to have one that you can print out, take to uh, your printer and and have it printed on heavy cardstock, and then you can punch holes in it or have the printer do it. So sign up for his newsletter and you will, and that'll be out in about a week. So, but, and then we're going to have it on YouTube as well, edited, so all the burps and beeps are missing. I hope that answered your question. Okay. What I'm doing is a couple of final touches, softening a few things. This side of the bank needs to be more in shadow here. And I'm adding different colors to it to help unify. So it has a little bit of green in it, it has a little bit of this in it. Um, I'm opening up a few lights back here by lifting with my brush. I want a little bit of light hitting the ground here. And this will help kind of allow the eye to recess back a little bit into the woods here. But the idea is to get the whole painting going at the same time. You don't want something happening up here and you've done all the work up there and you start down here. You want this to emerge as um, like a Polaroid print. Uh, where it comes into view all at one time, not one little spot here, one little spot there, uh, because what you'll end up with is, is a very spotty looking painting where it won't unify and hold together. And I'm adding quite a bit of color here at the end and just allowing it to fall. And I want a little bit of light showing up in here. All these little things. The last part of my paintings... Um, on a large painting, the last phase of the painting could take up to two, two and a half hours maybe on a larger painting. But it's all these little things I'm doing at this point. And I'm also stepping back and looking at the painting from a distance. Um, I never paint from start to finish right on top of the painting. Because that doesn't allow you to see it from a distance, see how it's holding up, see what you need to do next. Um, it's something that you have to kind of uh, be conscious of. So get up off your seat and take a look at what's happening. Uh, take a look at how the values are reacting. Do I have my darks dark enough? Is the background falling back or is it coming forward? Um, You've got to be able to analyze things. And if you have problems with that, do what I did as a student. I took my mother's egg timer and set it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and I started looking at how things were, were reacting. When the alarm went off, I got up and I looked at it for maybe 
five, ten minutes trying to analyze what do I have, to, what's the one thing I need to do next? Okay, um, Al Porter wants to know what color is the dark in the water? That is the ultramarine blue, the sap green, and a little bit of the burnt sienna. And then I have this transition area here that is a little bit of the raw sienna. So, what we've got here is what I call a finished demonstration for the most part. Um, I don't think that we need to take it too much further, but there is one thing that I can do at this point is that I can take a little bit of gouache, whoop, excuse me, and I'll show you what I do. I never use white gouache straight, I never use white straight. Again, as I'm always stating, there's no such thing as white. So I take a little bit of the white gouache on the toothbrush, and I'm going to take a little bit of the raw sienna, like so, and let's make it snow ever so slight. The more water you add to it, the bigger drops you have, the less water, the smaller drops. So I'm going to add just a little bit of snowflakes to this, just enough. And as I come down towards the snow bank embankment here, I'm going to use a little bit darker snow so it shows up in the light. And it's just enough to give a feeling that it's lightly snowing. So let's take the tape off, see where we're at, and we'll compare the first one being two colors to the second one being five colors. And you'll see that color tells a whole different story, and it also allowed me to express the scene in a different way. Uh, June wants to know if you ever use Daniel Smith watercolor. Yes, I've used Daniel Smith. It's excellent watercolor. Um, there was one time where I was using three to four brand, different brands of paint at one time. I was using Daniel Smith. I was using M. Graham, which has a honey, honey in its vehicle to make it work, uh, which is a very old recipe for watercolors. Okay, you have two watercolors here. I don't know whether you can see them both at the same time. They both have a different look to them. They both have uh, a different feeling to them because color will, will give you a feeling of whatever you want, a, a nice feeling or a bad feeling. Color influences our thoughts on things. This one is predominantly green. This one is predominantly uh, bluish gray in most areas, but you can see on how the color reacts, how the values react. Now, I don't have the darks as dark on the first one as I do on the second one. So you have to kind of understand that value has a lot to do with how it portrays a subject matter. So you cannot cheat yourself on value. <coughs> as I said, Value does all the work and color always gets all the glory because we're a very color orientated society, but we have to learn to see the value of things first. And you can see that the uh, value changed in here. This is a little bit more dramatic on this side uh, with one I just finished and the other one has a totally different look to it. Um, it also has its own dramatic look, but it doesn't have the same feeling. And color will give you a different feeling, tells you a different story. And this is what you're really looking for. So understand your value. Understand the lightness, the darkness. Remember, your darks will recede. Your lights come forward. Your darks get lighter as they go back, and your lights get darker as they go back. But they are its darkest and lightest forms closest to you. Okay, Lori said, wonderful lesson, and Shanna Lynn said, this was wonderful painting, beautifully done, thank you for the demonstrating. Uh, Barbara Berry said, very interesting how different the two paintings are, great. Uh, Josephine, does it break the rule to put 
light trees sections in the middle of the painting? There are no rules. Um, the, the light sections of the trees in here. Now, if they were bothersome, let's see what we can do to maybe change that a little bit. Uh, um, what that it's, thing. what it's doing is it's creating a little bit more contrast, but let's say I take that light and I add some warmth to it, some burnt sienna, but no, it does not break any rules. And I'm going to add a little bit more. If I feel it's too much, I can always take off some, but I can take and tone these down to give them a little bit more warmth into the woods. And it'll have, again, it has a different feeling. But the question is, uh, no, it doesn't break any rules. Marianne said, thank you. Great inspiration. And Chantal, I believe she was the one from Belgium, said, very nice. Thank you for the demonstration. They are both nice. Thank you both. Have a nice evening. Thank you, you too. And Lisa from the great North Woods of Wisconsin said, so interesting to see them side by side. Thank you for your demonstration. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for watching. I really appreciate it. Remember to sign up for Dale's newsletter and like his page. Or attend one of the workshops. I'd be glad to meet you. Um, that's it, Dale, I guess. Well, once again, thank you all for watching and your comments. Uh, and again, these are demonstrations. I mean, these can be worked out in more detail and so forth, but it is something that... You get an idea of how to handle value. It wasn't in excruciating depth of value, but just I want you to have a good understanding of how value reacts within a landscape. So we're going to sign off now, and thank you again very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good week.